Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Matteo. And uh, I'm I'm so happy to be with everyone. And it's great to see those groups in particular. Uh, we were hoping that folks could gather as possible in groups. We desperately need to have these conversations. I have my copy of the magazine, the, the current issue, my well-worn copy. And uh, it's not just well-worn because I work here. It's well-worn because I've spent a lot of time with it. Our topic was and is civic hope in a time of division. And we have four really wise, uh, smart people joining us. Uh, each of them is going to speak for a very brief time, but then they're going to stay with us for the hour to answer your questions. And our, our topics that we're covering we could easily have all day seminars on each of these topics. So it's actually kind of silly that we're asking them to summarize in five minutes uh, the essential issues related to these topics. But nevertheless, that's what we've asked these wise people to do. I'm going to go in order of uh, the discussion guide that we sent all of you who pre registered. So that's the order in which we're going to be introduced to our speakers, to our presenters, three of whom are in the magazine, the current issue. And the fourth is sort of a special case, a friend of the Focolare, uh, who some of you have had a chance to meet. But let me just introduce them very quickly. Uh, Joseph Vukov is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Loyola Chicago, and he's the author of a few books most recently with New City Press, the Perils of Perfection on the Limits and Possibilities of Human Enhancement. Uh, and then after Joe will come Mary Novak. Mary Novak is Executive Director of Network Lobby for Catholic Social Justice in Washington, D.C. After that, we will have Kate O'Brien, who is known to many of us as the Director of the Focolare Forum for Dialogue and Culture. And then uh, Patrick Gilger, S.J., uh, is a priest of the Midwest province of the Society of Jesus. He's a PhD from the New School in New York, and he's an assistant professor of sociology at Loyola, Chicago. So let me turn to Joseph Vukov first. Uh, he wrote on artificial intelligence in the magazine. There's a lot to be said about what AI has to do with this time of division. And Joe, could you just introduce the subject to us and sort of get us going? Yeah, thanks, John and Matteo and everyone for organizing this event. And thanks for everyone who is here attending. And I'm excited for a conversation with everybody and to hear from my fellow panelists. Um, I'm going to try and keep this to five minutes. So what I want to talk about just really quickly is some of the challenges that I see AI raising how those apply to our political and social lives and compound problems that are maybe already there. And then some of the suggestions I have for thinking about ways to move forward. So some of this might sound familiar to you. Some of it, we could get very much in the weeds, but we'll try and avoid the weeds for now. Um, so three quick problems. First of all is AI inevitably produces and compounds biases and misinformation. We could talk about this more, but one reason is a technical reason with how an AI is built. The way you build an AI is with lots and lots and lots of data. And you have to use so much that inevitably misinformation and bias gets in there, no matter what your intentions are. So that's a problem and it ends up compounding biases and misinformation. And no doubt you've seen some of this um, in, in the news as AI has been such so much in the news cycle the last, last year or so. A second problem with AI is that it has the power to sway our opinions. Um, we don't even have to talk about the newfangled stuff here. Think about your own Amazon YouTube browsing. I know Amazon has nudged me towards books with its AI algorithms and YouTube has gotten me watching videos for a half hour and I'll pinch myself and realize I don't even care about this video. Why am I watching it? But somehow it knows my desires before I do and very scarily helps shaping those desires in ways that we're sometimes not intentional about. And a third one are the deep fakes that AI is capable of. No doubt you've seen there were all the memes of Pope Francis doing all manner of things about a year ago that were all over the internet. Um, he became very much a, a, a um, central point for these memes, but we're capable of gem generating audio and visual images um, in ways that look very realistic, but aren't. So a lot of times, at least in my context, we initially start thinking about some of these problems with AI 
in terms of education, right? I'm a professor and my fellow professors talk a lot about how do we catch students cheating with this? Um, I know the entertainment industry and uh, the actual, the, the um, magazine industry, um, relevantly enough, has talked about this a lot, thinking about, well, how can we copyright our content if AI is using our content and generating content that looks like the stuff that we're publishing? Um, those are important concerns. What I want us to focus on today is to think more about the ways in which these problems apply to our social and political lives. So we can think about this more, but think about all three of these themes, biases and misinformation, the capacity for deep faking, the capacity to sway opinion in ways that we're maybe not even fully aware of. Those should all be really scary when we start thinking about the potential that AI has for shaping and turning and giving us misinformation in our political lives. And I think has really the capacity to silo us even more, to increase biases even more, to compound misinformation even more. So I really do think that some of the worries people have been talking about when it comes to artificial intelligence have been well-founded. I think there is a lot of potential there for some really deeply serious problems and things that can really compound the problems that we've already seen in society the last 10 or 20 years. So what are some solutions? I just want to hint at that as well. And then hopefully I'll be in right around five minutes. Um, two things. One is education. I think that the more we learn about artificial intelligence, even just a little bit, even just learn about some of the problems it poses, a little bit of education goes a long ways. Think about how most of us here have at least a passing familiarity with internet spaces. So we know roughly what Wikipedia is. We know kind of what we're doing when we do a Google search. We kind of know what social media is. You know, you don't have to be a programmer or a tech person to know this. We kind of have a passing familiarity in a way that we're able to notice, oh, that's an ad or, oh, this is coming from this website that looks not, not that trustworthy. I think just a little bit more of that when it comes to artificial intelligence. Most of us don't have that literacy yet, but if we build it, I think that's one way to really protect against some of the problems that AI is raising and hopefully protect against some of the sil siloing effects that AI really could have when applied to our political lives. And then the second piece of advice I wanted to leave you with, and again, we can talk about whatever you want to when it comes to AI more than this. Um, I think this is probably a good suggestion for a lot of our technological lives is to dial things back by maybe a couple of decades. Um, I'm currently sitting in my basement on the internet, using a fancy microphone on the internet, on my laptop computer. I'm not a technology naysayer, but I do think that sometimes the best response to new technologies is to say no to them, to say, I'm not going to get my political information and have my political opinion shaped by the internet, but rather by the communities that care for me and by the people I interact with on a daily basis. Um, so I think a move to less, less, digital and more local spaces, more in-person communication. It's good for us in many ways, but I think when it comes to our political and social lives, I think that that can be a really good thing. And we're not fully there here right now because we're on Zoom, but I think things like this are a very healthy sort of forum for doing that and much healthier than casting off into the netherworld of the internet where the AIs lurk and have the potential to sway us this way and that. So that's that's my opening thoughts. Thank you, Joe. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to hold. I have a question, but I'm going to hold and move to Mary. Uh, Mary Novak, your your article in our current issue was an interview that we turned into an article. And I think I can be blamed if someone needs to be blamed for its title. But I'm quite sure I took the title from a quote from you. You have to get involved. Um, I, I, I tell us tell us what you want us to know today, but I, I hope you'll also address uh, that subject because there's some people here who probably don't want to be involved in the political process. Great, thank you, John. And um, I am really delighted to be with all of you this evening. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. And thank you, Joseph, for that introduction because it's really a wonderful segue into what I wanted to talk about. The election and AI is a very particular interest of mine and my organization for the reasons that will become clear with my few comments. But let me start by introducing you, for those of you who don't know the organization network um, that I lead, I wanna introduce it quickly so that you have context for my comments. So network was founded 52 years ago by US Catholic sisters. 
one of, and it is one of the early inter-congregational ministries of Catholic sisters in the United States. So after Vatican II, many of the sisters had moved out of their traditional ministries of education, healthcare, and parish work. And they had moved into the communities doing direct service work, doing organizing work with folks pushed to the margins by our systems and structures. And in doing so, they had encounters. And in, in the midst of those encounters, they started to see patterns and realizing that there was a way that the systems and structures could be changed by laws at the federal level. So in 1972, they discerned after some time here in DC together to set up a political ministry in DC for systemic change at the federal level and network was founded. So today we are lay, religious and clergy, Catholics and Catholic adjacent folks, uh, all who share the passion for a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, inclusive democracy where everyone flourishes, which is really the focus of our election work this year. And as I explained in the May, June edition of Living City, that vision of an inclusive democracy is under severe threat. International democracy experts are very clear that the, US, the US's democracy is extremely fragile right now. And they agree we have all the indicators necessary for a civil war. Now, and until, 19, uh, until 2023, the US had been on a downward trajectory for 17 straight years. But we actually gained a few points because of the 2022 midterms that went relatively well. There was minimal violence or threats of violence. So in late 2023, we, we gained a few points with these international democracy um, experts. So in other words, we actually can do something about this downward trajectory because we already did it in 2022. And our work now is to encourage everybody to be moving in that direction. So when people ask me if we at Network um, will be getting involved in anti-polarization efforts. I say yes, but not this year. And this is a metaphor my friend, uh, Dr. Don McCrabb, who leads the United States Catholic Mission Association, he came up with in dialogue with me over coffee one day in the office. Um, and we were talking about how our democracy is like a patient who is in the midst of a heart attack and has been admitted to the ER. Network, because of our mission, is working on getting that heart going again. Anti-polarization folks are coming in after the ER folks are through, and they're to be working on the weight loss efforts and the other health and well-being efforts that are so necessary for the patient, right? Um, now, those latter efforts will be needed for the long term, and of course they can start now. And in fact, talking about the election with folks and building bridges is a good way to start. So Network's work this year is doing education around our elections and it starts with helping people not be paralyzed by fear. And then helping, own, helping them own their identity as faith-based voters, really grounding their voting in their faith tradition and in their spiritual lives, understanding why voting matters. And then we have trainings where we help people break through the election noise. And the way to do that is being in community and talking to each other, not, not on text and not on social media, but in person. Um, and we give trainings on how to actually talk across difference about the election. And then we also, part of our training is to help prepare communities for the election by helping them develop voting plans, 
uh, coordinating voter registration drives, volunteering at the polls, et cetera. But really underscoring what Joseph suggested, which are um, ways to address the biases and the concerns around AI. So I'll stop there as an introduction, but I think this flows really well, what we do from what the introduction that, that Joseph gave us as well. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, I agree, the flow does seem to work and it moves directly now to Kate O'Brien, who um, I've got to say has a job that I do not envy, uh, trying to convince us all to learn to disagree better. Um, mm -hmm. So Kate, tell us how it's possible. <laughs> um, I think that's a great question. And when I figure it out fully, I will get back to you all. <laughs> but um, I think the the main thing that that uh, I've realized, and also um, talking with others, that's clear is it's right now at least it's not our instinct, right? Like it's it's uh, our instinct to either um, run away from the conflict or to enjoy it probably too much. I think uh, in your article, John, in, in this issue of, of Living City, you you also spoke about how some people revel in the polarities. Um, and so I think there's there's both, right? Um, and so to, to answer your question um, of the how, I think there's a lot of interior work that needs to be done. Um, we've been partnering um, with someone who, with an organization who a representative is on the screen right now, um, an organization called um, the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. Um, and they've um, done a lot of work with us and also like identifying the, the introspective work that you need to do. Like, what is it that's bothering me? Why am I being so triggered by one question or another? Um, what's really annoying me? What are we really talking about? Um, and so I think that's a big part of it is, um, is the introspective work. Um, and I think the, the part of my job that I love the most, um, it, so you were saying it's it's a job that you don't envy, but the part that I love the most is um, working with others. And so there's such a network of people out there who who really want to do this. There's people out there, organizations and individuals out there who are really experts in different ways to to learn how to disagree better. Um, and so that's that's another thing that that I really enjoy is is working with folks like that, uh, lifting up the work that they do. And so that's something that um, in the, the article that I wrote um, is really what I'm encouraging folks to do is to, to learn more about those organizations and see um, how you either as an individual, as your parish community, your church community, whatever it may be, um, can, can use the materials um, that they have. I think the, the last thing I'll say as the, as the how, um, from my personal experience is also um getting out of um our our bubbles um it's it's almost cliche uh, at this point but precisely because of what uh, joe was talking about at the beginning it's uh, increasingly um cliche but it's also increasingly difficult right because um the as we're on in the, this technical world as uh as we're living on the internet, the internet sends us into those bubbles or rabbit holes or whatever we want to call them. I spoke to someone today who, who spoke about them as walled gardens. Um, and so um, we're encouraged not only by technology, but by society in general to, to get into to our silos and to stay in our silos. So much so that if we're even seen talking to others from out the, from the other group, um, or simply like listening, engaging with people from the other group, people will accuse us of like agreeing with them, right? And so there's this um, culture like a, a, you, we can talk about cancel culture, we can talk about whatever you want to call it, right? But this idea of if I disagree with someone, um, I don't even want to associate with them. Um, and so while it's cliche to say, um, get out there and talk to people who are different from you, it's um, it's not easy. And so sometimes that can be something um, as simple as um, 
people from other faith communities. I see uh, one of the groups connected uh, today is Atlanta Ecumenical. So I'm guessing that they're from uh, different church uh, communities. We see them waving. So even something like that, getting um, in touch with folks who are part of uh, a different group that isn't even along the, the binary of um, red, blue, conservative, liberal, but just different from us, right? Um, uh, or a different cultural group, different ethnic group, whatever it may be, um, just to get us out of our silos. And even if they have um, similar thoughts to us about some things, even being in a different group can help us see it from another perspective. Um, and so that's what I, I really encourage is to, to be like Atlanta Ecumenical or be <laughs> to, to uh, in, force yourself into spaces where there's people who are different from you. Thank you, Kate. And now we're going to turn to Patrick Gilger, who we're delighted is with us as well. And uh, I love your topic. Um, it intrigued me immediately when I saw this was the topic you were suggesting to bring to this because you're a priest, and I don't often hear priests talk about this, but you're a sociologist, and I'd love to hear both the priest and the sociologist talk about this. But let me also just put forward something that Kate just suggested as well that we're not all Christian here. There are Jews and Muslims who also, for instance, subscribe to Living City. Some of them may be here with us today. So what's the political role of the church, of the synagogue, of the Zendo, of the mosque? And does that make us comfortable or does that scare us to death? Yeah, that's a good question, John. So the first thing I might say, do you, do you feel uh, more nervous about my questions here than you did about Kate's job title? I don't know if there's a comparison you want to want to make now so the the thing i would want to say first in response to your question is that um so i want to double down but also soften um so i don't think actually that i can step back from the title the political role of the church and the reason is that is because um I can't answer what the political role of certain kinds of uh my brothers and sisters who Muslim or Jewish or Hindu uh, would want to take up or be invited by God as they know God to take up. But just because I can't answer that doesn't mean that I need to stop answering the question for myself, you know, or helping the church, right? That's part of one of my jobs as a, as a priest is to help the church think through its own role in the political public sphere um, without having that be, you know, the ownership of all the roles. No, it's ours and we can own that and try to step forward in that role. Um, so what I want to say there is to put some of this in a little bit of a context, right, to help us at, ask um, this question of the political public role of the church today in some kind of context. It's to help us recognize it this way. Those, those words, you know, religion and politics, these kinds of things often don't go together very smoothly in our day and age. And those are the kinds of things that we're often told to, you know, not talk about at the dinner table or to keep to the side of conversations because they're too hot. I understand that, right? But one of the things that I do in my own sociological work is help us to recognize why we think that, like why we have that story in our heads, that moving religion off the table will allow us to get along better. And what happens when we do that? One way we can understand that is that um, in the transitions, the long, centuries long transitions that we've had into our modern or postmodern or secular age, whatever we want to call this time that we live in today, um, into this transition, one of the things that's happened is that we've begun living together in communities that are not bonded by religious identity, but by something else, often by the power of the nation state, right? So that we're citizens of a nation, of a state rather than members of a particular religious community. And there were all kinds of huge arguments and disagreements and violence over that making that kind of transition. But almost virtually all major religions have made that transition to accepting and in fact celebrating the fact that we now live together in a diverse multicultural political entity called the state, right? And then the question becomes, is there anything that the church has to do now or is it just the case that religion ought to be private and removed from the public sphere, right? Because we don't act now as, now we're citizens, not religious participants. We act as publicly as citizens. We vote and we do these things. 
My contention actually is to disagree with this. And I think that um, the church itself needs to take much more seriously its role as a political agent. Now, let me say one final thing about what I mean by that. Again, some historical context. If, if you know, for Catholics, right, speaking now for Catholics, um, if we can take seriously the fact that the church is uh, to be, in some ways, the the bearer of uh, an ongoing conduit through which God is attempting to save the world. We don't need to say the only one. We don't need to say even the most, you know, I don't hear, right? We don't need to say the, the most primary one. But if we can say that the church is this body, a corporate body through which God is acting to help bring about something like the kingdom of God, then the follow-up question we have to act is, ask is, how are we supposed to do that? Now, there are all kinds of answers that have been given to that question over history. Um, two quick ones, and then I'll say what my proposal might be for ours today. For the first 300 years of the church, maybe the Edict of Milan was in 313, right? So 300 years or so. We might say that the church's pu public political activity mostly consisted in martyrdom. That was both, you know, the willingness to uh, suffer and die for a faith, but also witnessing, so public witnessing of multiple kinds. But after, certainly after Constantine, um, for a long time, the church's role was no longer martyrdom in this way, but it shifted. And there are lots of descriptors that we could give of this, but one of the most important ones that we could say was the church's political role then was governance and to participate in helping to govern the world, right? And to, to do that. Now, since at least since, you know, 1964, Dignitatis Humanae at the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, that is no longer what the Catholic Church says our public political role is. The difficulty that we're faced with is that we don't really have a good answer as to what our role ought to be now that we know our role is no longer to attempt to govern by signing concordats with nation states so that everybody there is officially under a certain religion or these kinds of things. The question then is, what is our role? The word that I think that we might consider, that I'd like us to consider um, taking up as a descriptor for what that public political role of the church is, is recognition. It's kind of like martyrdom. It's kind of like witnessing in that way. But I think there's a way for us to understand what we are being called to do as, uh, as Christians and as Catholics is helping, to, um, helping our democratic policies, polities, to recognize people who are very different from us in their differences and to be able to see them and celebrate them there so that people don't enter the public sphere feeling that they have to, I have to claim my own rights, which generates only more divisiveness and bitterness and rivalry, isolation. But instead to say, uh, who are you? Who is, and what gift are you bringing to the public sphere? If we could be that, listeners, recognizers in the public sphere, I think that we would do uh, a lot of good for helping the church to ask answer for ourselves this question of the political role to which we're called in our own times. Thank you. I think we now have 25 minutes for questions. I imagine that there are lots of them. I have my own, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut, I think, because I want to hear from those who have joined us. Particularly, it'd be great to hear from a group or two, if you're able. And I'll repeat what Matteo said. If there's anyone who is not wanting to unmute themselves and ask a question themselves, then you could type it in the chat, and I will, I will see that, and uh, I can ask your question for you. Well, Joe Vukov, I'm going to ask you my question, which is, is, is AI inevitable? Do we have to just accept that it's inevitable? Yeah, no, thanks for the question, John. Um, I think maybe for better or for worse, probably for worse, the answer is yes. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when the internet launched. Um, and I remember looking at it and thinking, well, this is kind of a 
a neat trick. You know, you can look up some baseball stats and I don't know what my hobbies were at the time, but I don't really see this thing catching on. I don't really see what good this is going to be. But of course, now we see um, the internet interspersed into every area of our lives, our banking, our communications, our social lives, or I mean, this event right here. And, and in ways that we couldn't have imagined in the 90s, um, in the early 90s, when the internet was kind of getting its legs underneath it. Um, my suspicion is that AI is going to be kind of like that. Right now, we're living in the Wild West days of artificial intelligence, where it's kind of gimmicky, kind of little strange. You kind of look at it and think, well, that's kind of a neat trick, but I don't really see what use that is. Um, I think we are starting to see the the potential for misuse, um, but I think we haven't. It hasn't quite solidified into how it's going to be integrated into our lives, but. I, I think that that's the way it's going such that 20 years from now, it will look very different. It won't be people making pictures of the Pope online using artificial intelligence. It'll be things that are much more integrated in our lives in the same way the internet is now integrated into our lives. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing, um, but I do think that it means that we need to do the careful work now of thinking through some of these issues. Um, I think that, in Mary's comments, talking about doing the work now of thinking through how is AI potentially undermining the political process? How is AI increasing the siloing effect that we are already seeing? And doing that work now before the integration and sort of the 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 mass proliferation goes on, I think will serve us well. Because we saw how social media, media took us by surprise in some ways, and we've had to spend years backpedaling to try and figure out how can we fix all the things that social media broke. Um, and we have the advantage now of knowing the power that AI has. I think the, the foreknowledge to see that it will be widespread going forward. So I think it really is an opportunity for us and that we've seen the ways that things like social media and the internet um, affected us. And now we can kind of maybe get out ahead of that a little bit. Um, so that's my, I don't know, putting on the hat of a prophet for a second. I, that's my suspicion is that it's not going to be leaving us anytime soon. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Mary, I want to ask you, I think about the classic virtues and the the ones that apply most to your work or the work that you are trying to get all of us to be involved in. I mean, it, I feel like that's part of what your your work is, is to is to get us involved in ways that we may not necessarily want to be. I'm guessing that hope and patience, for instance, are not adequate that instead what we need is more like courage? That's my question is. Oh, okay, so that is your question. Um, I actually think hope is hugely important here, John. And courage, definitely. Um, I'll just describe our experience last year. Um, as we, we're getting ready, our, 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 my colleagues, there's about 25 of us who work for Network. We were getting ready for this year and looking at all of the democracy studies that I summarized in my opening comments. We actually had to bring in a clinical psychologist to work with our staff um, because we have a very multiracial staff. Um, and they know what this next election could mean for their lives if it goes in certain directions, um, which is what the concern about the fragility of our democracy means. Um, and so we did a lot of interior work, which is what we heard from Kate is really important. We did a lot of internal work. We did work within our community and on the other side of it, we, were, we, we created within ourselves and amongst ourselves space to be creative and to actually live into hope about this coming election. Because we did a lot of study on how to use this, this very polarized time and this election time to start the bridge building that needs to be long haul work for us to recover um, and move into a more healthy democracy. But as we sit here today, my colleagues and myself are so hopeful, but it's not 
it's not an innocent, you know, um, ungrounded hope. It is hope because of deep study, deep prayer, deep work, coming up with ways through this and walking with our interfaith colleagues here on Capitol Hill. So we work with our, in coalition with our Muslim, Jewish, Protestant, and other faith traditions and Catholic groups from across the spectrum um, who are all leaning into this time and, and working around the new political wedge issues, which is of course we all know is the immigration issue. Um, and as we're doing that, as we're having conversations we are living in joyful hope and we didn't think we could get there a year ago. So the courage to lean into the pain and then to start pulling um, from all of our spiritual and psychological resources. Um, and we are a faith-based organization. So that just undergirds everything we do. Um, we pray together, we, we laugh and worship together. Um, so I, I actually think it's more than just the courage piece. It, it is moving towards hope, but you have to clear the space to be able to do that. Wow, I am so glad I asked that question. And now I feel like I need a, a Mary Novak uh, word of encouragement on my phone every morning when I wake up or something. Thank you. Uh, so we now have questions in the chat that I know everyone can see. Sasha, I will read what Sasha wrote in response to Kate's comments regarding being able to expose oneself to differing points of view and expand beyond our silos. It feels important to take personal responsibility at the individual level, to hold space with curiosity for the views of others in order to consider and understand versus immediately dismiss that different or opposing view. I'd love to hear from Kate, anyone on the panel or anyone listening about concrete actions we can practice to increase our capacity to hold space for the opposing views of others or work through triggers. So Kate, we'll turn that to you for starters. Sure, yeah, thank you, Sasha. Um, I think um, something that that I've found uh, important um, is uh, something that a friend of mine uh, defines as setting the table. Um, so uh, in again, in our work with uh, with ICRD um, that we've been doing, uh, one of one of the things that I like to to quote from from those programs is um, something that that one of the the uh, uh, program leaders, um, has invited us to do is to define are we or like differentiate should I say between um, debate discussion and dialogue um, already in our own minds right um, and so I think like one of my takeaways from that was also to um, ask myself why am I having this conversation or if possible with the with the person that I'm engaging with why are we having it, right? Um, are we having it to debate an issue, to convince each other? Are we having it to understand each other better? Or am I having it to understand them better? Um, and to kind of check in with that, if it's something that I'm doing myself, uh, like if I'm just defining, why am I having this conversation? To check in with myself every now and then. Um, or if it's something that we've agreed, um, then there's also a, a way to say, I think this this conversation isn't going where we, we hoped it would go. So uh, either let's hit the reset button or let's get back to it another time. Um, and so I think for me, that's, that's a really useful tool. Um, another one is also um, having kind of like a buddy system, right? Um, both like, having someone in my life or someone's in my life um that think differently from me and and um and they know that that I enjoy talking to them because they think differently from me and vice versa and so having someone um with a, that level of trust um i think is really useful 
Um, and also buddy system in the sense, uh, you know, having friends that you uh, share the the desire to build unity, to cross uh, uh, barriers, to build bridges, um, and to to share with them when I'm finding it tough, uh, or to share with them when I feel like I've been triggered. So to get to the question about the trigger too. Um, so trust, um, not necessarily just across differences, like I'm, I'm talking about two, two different relationships, right? Um, but also trust with people who I know like share the desire that I have to build bridges. And so they'll hold me accountable. Like if I'm just like venting because that person has annoyed me, <laughs> um, they'll hold me accountable to them and be like, hey, but you know, what were, what was behind what they were saying, you know? And so um, I think going to the right person to vent <laughs> may be what I'm saying, um, but not only, right? Um, and then I think the the trigger part, I think it's it's uh, useful to ask ourselves, like, why have I gotten to the the conclusion I've gotten to, the position I've gotten to, the the ideology I've gotten to? Um, and to to think about that uh, like vis-a-vis -vis the person that we're we're engaging with too, or the people we're engaging with. Um, the uh, one person who we often have uh, active debates uh, with each other is a brother of mine. Um, and I know he wouldn't mind me sharing this. Um, and I think often for me, like when we're in the thick of it and with a family member, it can become even more emotional, right? Because, you know, like I grew up kicking and punching him literally. So, you know, it's like anything goes, right? Um, and there's that like, like, a very emotional relationship but but when I'm in the thick of it with him and um, also to realize that we're coming from even though we like we grew up together or whatever we are coming from two different things like we've you know since we've left home like lots of different things have happened have happened to to each of us respectively right and to to kind of honor that uh and to yeah to honor the fact that that uh he's coming from a different place than I am and to enjoy what perspective he has to give me so in a nutshell. Thank you. Now, this the question that's here from Anne, I confess, I don't think I understand, but is this a question for you, Patrick Gilger? Did I miss that you used a phrase about the church's role in recognition? Um, yeah, you, that's for me, John. Okay, yeah. please. Thank you. Yeah, well, then let me just try to say something maybe more practical about it here. I think that the interpersonal stuff that we're talking about and the interior work, I, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. Like we have to be with one another. We have to pray. We have to participate in, you know, conversations that can root us in our identities. Um, even I might say for Christians, one of the things that we might have to do is to realize that it's not our job to fix the world. And um, when we try to take over that position of responsibility, it will only cause disaster and anxiety, which does not mean we have nothing to do. We have much to do. But that's, um, that kind of abnegation of responsibility uh, eliminates the either or that we can fall into. But speaking of like eliminating and reframing, we could take this from a personal stance to maybe a, a more public one. And, and Mary mentioned very beautifully the um, the point about the hot topic about the border right now, the migration on the border. Um, some of you may very well have seen uh, Bishop Seitz, uh, who is the Bishop of El Paso, wrote a really beautiful uh, piece maybe oh, two months ago or something like that in America media. And one of the things he called for there was um, what he says, uh, a spiritual training in the act of recognition with regard to what we are calling the crisis at the border. And he, I put those in quotation marks because he puts those in quotation marks. And that spiritual training, one of the things he hopes that we'll be able to do is prevent us from just sliding into the kind of normal discourse about difficult political situations that it's very easy for us to fall into and from which laws are passed. Right, right. Those are, those things are not separated. They're absolutely intimately tied together. Um, particular policies are enacted because of the particular language that we use that frames a position, uh, a, an issue in a particular way. And so he says, no, we we cannot frame the situation on the border as a crisis. We ought not frame the situation on the border as a crisis, not because things are not bad, but because the response that one gives to a crisis is damage control 
uh, law and order, immediacy, these kinds of things. And he says, these are not the kinds of responses that we as the church are being asked to offer. Um, others may do what they feel called to do, right? Uh, but in a democracy, we get to feel, we get to offer this as a gift. And instead then of saying, you know, this is a crisis. And so therefore we have to respond this way or this way or this way. Our job um, as Catholics or as Christians can be to see these people at the border as potential brothers and sisters in Christ. That identity is just as possible and just as real. We can recognize them that way just as quickly. And it has political effects as we can as, you know, uh, an illegal migrant or something like this. The name uh, shapes the recognition that we are giving to the particular situation. The recognition shapes political outcomes in really serious ways. Uh, our task then of the inner tasks is related to the outer task. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Matteo Pota, who has a question, which might end up being our last question. We'll see. So my is a question for, you know, for the whole, for, for the speakers. I really liked, I was very inspired, like John, I think many others, from what Mary was saying about hope, this kind of hope that is not net deep, you know, but it's kind of grounded in something deeper. And so, you know, we have different thoughts. We have AI, the political role of the church, you know, polarization, political, you know, involvement. So I want to ask you, like, can you, can you remember... Um, can you recall one episode that you witnessed recently that gave you hope? But I'm talking about something that was really hard to do that you saw that instead worked, that it went in a hopeful direction, either in your life, in, in that topic that you were exploring, or in somebody else. Um, thank you, Matteo. Um, I'll just say this. Uh, I stepped in to say Mass on Saturday afternoon last weekend for another brother Jesuit here at a... Um, a home for men and women with mental and physical handicaps. And the, here in Chicago, we have this place is called Misericordia, uh, founded by a, a, a nun maybe 60 years ago. And they have 30, 40, 50 homes around here, along with some you know centers and conference rooms and meeting places. People who work there, who help to care for, companion, collaborate with these uh, people with mental and physical handicaps. It was my first time I'd been over there. I lived in New York for six years. I'd never been over there before. I went over there to say mass and um, maybe 150 people, 125, a lot of people, um, almost all of them uh, with some kinds of, of handicaps there. And uh, in after communion, I distributed the Eucharist and uh, the communion song, which was sung by all of these people, was um, uh, Behold the Body of Christ. And uh, there's a line in the middle of that that says, um, how beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. And I was standing up there purifying the vessels and I'm looking out at all of these people. And according to, um, you know, the standards of recognition that uh, Hollywood has imposed upon me, I uh, would not name many of these people beautiful. And in the midst of that, the song was challenging me to recognize that this is the body of Christ and it is beautiful. And I could see all these people of all different kinds of shapes um, and colors and capacities uh, singing, some attentive, some not, some paying attention to each other, some paying attention to me. This was the fullness of the body of Christ. It is there if we can see it. And our task then, I think, is to become courageous enough to act upon it and help ours to become a, a democratic a nation state that can live into that kind of recognition. I'll I'm attempt to follow, follow Father Patty's thoughts there, which is going to be a hard act to follow. Um, I see hope regularly in my students. So I you know, my day job, which is really my whole job in many ways, is teaching undergraduate students at Loyola. And I know I, I teach um, bioethics classes. I teach science and religion classes. I teach a lot of classes, just intro to philosophy classes, where I know there is a range of very wide range of opinions and wide range of stances and often very divisive um, opinions and stances about politics, about ethical life, about moral life, about religious life. And almost without exception, my students do a tremendous job having really difficult conversations day in and day out. So I really do think that 
if we create the right spaces and facilitate the right kinds of trust in each other, um, it takes work. It doesn't just happen. But I see my students doing this almost every single day when I walk into class. We're talking about these hot button issues and they show up and they want to learn from each other and they share their opinions and they take correction when it's there. So I, I am just regularly very impressed by my students. Um, and obviously they're an up and coming generation. So if they can do it, that's a really hopeful place for us to be at. I guess I'll add a little bit. Um, I was invited by Bishop Seitz to come to El Paso um, a few months ago after the beginnings of the process to try to shut down Annunciation House, which is the service for migrants that has been in operation for decades and run by a group of holy people. Um, and he invited people from all over the country, but also national organizations like Network to come and just be present to the situation in El Paso. People showed up. There were a thousand people in the square and I, I could talk for hours about the experience of that evening, but it was the best of public liturgy from Central America. And I've spent a lot of time in El Salvador, um, worked with the Jesuits for almost two, almost two decades. And so it was just the moment where people came together and Bishop Seitz preached and said, you can make our Christian work illegal, but we will never stop doing it. And, and it was a moment with the, the, the Jesuit parish in El Paso filled to the brim, turning people away because there was not enough room. And we could land in the midst of our faith life and understand what's wrong with our democracy, right? It, 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 we walked away with so much hope um, and so much life. So thanks for bringing Bishop Seitz into the space. Uh, Patrick. Um, so real quick, I, I think Mateo was asking for something really recent. I'm going to share something from a whole year ago, um, but I'm sharing it because um, it's about to happen again soon. So last year I went to, I was talking about the different organizations uh, a little while ago, right, that, that work in the space of bridge building. Um, one of those wonderful organizations and that hopefully many of you have heard of is Braver Angels. And so last year I went to my first national convention with Braver Angels. Um, and um, when you arrive at the convention, you have you you've identified uh, your political leaning. And so you you get either a blue lanyard or a red lanyard or a yellow one or uh, neither. Right. Um, the. I think the the thing that gave me um, hope was seeing how um, the 700 people present were taking um, the commitment really seriously. Uh, there was no lunch table that had only one color lanyard, right? Uh, there was no conversation during break times that was people well, only of people with the same color lanyard. Um, I think the an experience that that I uh, took away with me also as someone who um, is concerned about the polarization also within the Catholic Church is um, one day um, there was like a shout out if there's any Catholics who want to have lunch together and um, come on over. And so we we had a, a group of about 10 of us who who ate together again, very much uh, different color lanyards around the table. Um, and people were being very real. Um, first, we were just, you know, connecting like like people always do, right? Um, sharing stories, who we are, where we're from. Um, but uh, in 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 those stories, um, it came out that one person at the table um, is is bisexual, as part of the LBG, LGBTQ community, um, and was sharing about how she tries to live her faith as a Catholic. Um, in that community, there was someone across the table from her who um, has her friend just kicked her son out um, because he came out as gay. And she really understood why her friend did it. Uh, she she agreed with her friend. Uh, and it was a beautiful conversation, uh, very um, 
deep conversation. I mean, the rest of us around the table, so you can imagine a table of, of 10 people, two people that happen to be in the middle of the table having this conversation. It's almost like the rest of us were like rooting for them. Um, and we're having a really real uh, conversation, but really loving. Um, and at the end, um, both people felt really heard, really understood, and also um, understood each other uh, very deeply. And so that conversation gave me so much hope just in the in the light of polarization, but also in the light of the division also within our church. Um, and so uh, I'm uh, going back this year. Uh, it's going to happen in a couple of weeks. So anybody who is interested in those kind of experiences, um, shoot me an email uh, and uh, and uh, I can I can share how to get involved in those. Or of course, just Google Braver Angels or Listen First Project or any of those organizations that, that do that good work. Thank you very much. Let me just say thank you, Joe. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Patty. Um, I have a lot of hope at the end of this hour and a page full of notes. And I'm hoping that you all have something uh, roughly equivalent. And I'm going to turn it over to Mateo to sort of close us out. 